Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Aaron, host of the Trial Site News podcast. Thank you so much for joining in. Today, we have a very special guest. We have the Dean of the Duke School of Nursing, Dr. Vincent Ramos. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Aaron. I'm Vincent Ramos, and I am the Dean of the Duke University School of Nursing, as well as the Vice Chancellor for Nursing Affairs at Duke Health. Awesome. And Today, just for our viewers, a quick overview. He is gonna talk about a center that he founded, which is really interesting. And he's also going to talk a little bit about nurses and issues specific to nurses during the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, Dr. Ramos, can you tell us a little bit more about you, your background, how you got there? So thank you. That's a great segue to talking about nurses and also uh, the Center for Latino Adolescent and Family Health Class. So I, um, you know, I never envisioned, uh, Aaron, that I would be a dean of a school of nursing. I, you know, was born in the Bronx. Uh, both of my parents are immigrants, one from the Dominican Republic, one from Puerto Rico. And I um, always sort of considered what I experienced as a child in the Bronx as being normative. And what I mean by that is that I grew up in the South Bronx and a community with great socioeconomic disadvantage. And I kind of thought that that was the way that everybody lived. And I didn't see it as being so unusual until I got a little older and I started to visit other communities. And oftentimes it took the form of a yellow school bus that was from public school uh, from where I went to school into Manhattan. And I remember looking out and seeing communities uh, along Museum Mile and just thinking they look really different. And somehow the people who lived in those communities had very different lives than I had. And that led me to really try to understand why are there disparities in income, in health, in sort of probably uh, many of the indicators that we care about that today are called social determinants of health. But I started to you know, have an understanding that uh, I wanted to be part of the solution to addressing some of uh, the things that were the inequities in my community. Didn't have that language at the time. I just knew there were differences. But as I progressed, I started on a path that was really focused on social welfare and really thinking about specific cases or individuals and how I could elevate those cases to causes and became really interested in the values that uh, define social welfare. That led me to public health and really studying epidemiology and thinking about sort of the distribution and frequency of diseases, what kinds of things, uh, you know, sort of create illness in people and then how we could use science to intervene. And, but there was this nagging sort of sense that I wanted to have direct hands on trying to be part of the solution. And so that led me to nursing and I became very interested in not only becoming a registered nurse, but being an advanced practice registered nurse and caring for young people at risk and living with HIV and spent, uh, I trained here at Duke, but I, for most of my life, have lived in New York City. And um, I actually worked at Montefiore Medical Center, which is in the Bronx and is the home of the first adolescent AIDS program in the country. Uh, and that's where I provided care to young people uh, living at risk of HIV. So that's a long way of saying, long way of saying, Aaron, that all of those experiences kind of came together social welfare, public health, and nursing to really define who I am today, what is behind uh, sort of CLAF, the Center for Latino Adults and Family Health. And I hope that we'll have an opportunity to talk about some of the very large transformative health and social welfare events that have been happening in our country, like COVID, and kind of my thoughts about how those three things come together in ways that are shaping what we're doing as a school and what I am doing in my own work as a researcher and clinician. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I'm in New York City, so I uh, um, appreciated the, the New York background for mm -hmm. sure. Um, mm -hmm. So nurses, obviously, and thank you to all the nurses out there. Um, nurses have been on the front line of this doing tremendous work going above and beyond. At, I wanted to get your perspective, um, specific contributions nurses made during the COVID-19 pandemic, things that stand out to you, and also challenges that you see from your position as a nurse, as a dean of uh, a nursing school. So Dr. Aaron, that's a great question. And I guess I wanna answer that in a couple of ways. First, I'll start by saying, 
But I think unbeknownst to many, I, uh, nurses are the largest segment of the healthcare workforce. And for that matter, our public health uh, workforce, close to 4 million nurses in the United States and the vast majority of care, particularly sort of prevention and wellness across the, across the globe is actually provided by nurses. I think that that fact oftentimes uh, is overlooked. And I think that the indispensable role of nurses because of COVID has sort of been much more in focus. And today there's greater recognition that nurses have been, in my view, the backbone of the healthcare system. There are a couple of things that uh, I wanna sort of flag as being uh, important. One, you know, we can't be ready as a country for not only responding to current events, but also unfortunately thinking about future events if we're not elevating healthcare teams which are not only nurses, they include obviously physicians and pharmacists and other kinds of healthcare professionals. But because nurses represent the largest segment of the, health, the healthcare workforce, inevitably we need to support nurses to uh, practice at their full scope of practice. And I think there are a lot of controversies around our country, state by state about what nurses are permitted to do versus what they're trained to do. And you know, as the Dean of a School of Nursing, I would argue that we need to allow each and every health professional, including nurses, to operate the full scope of their professional license. And that means that we need to allow advanced practice nurses to you know, care for patients, particularly as it pertains to areas where there is a limited number of healthcare providers. There are many areas that are underserved where care is, uh, there's not access. There are not providers who can provide services and I think that nurses can help fill that gap. And it doesn't mean that there needs to necessarily be tension between physicians and nurses. It's actually a team, a team that is complementary, that actually together is taking care of populations of patients. And if we work collaboratively, we can actually do a much better job at achieving some of the outcomes that we need to actually achieve. I also would say that nurses have uh, made incredible sacrifices over the past 20 months and I've been at the forefront of uh, you know, being the profession that really was providing care in critical care ICU units, was uh, hands-on in terms of involvement with vaccine efforts and, and sort of rollout and making sure that we were able to deliver the vaccine to folks. And I think that nurses have been uh, you know, redeployed and making tremendous contributions to caring for people that are quite ill uh, who you know, unfortunately have uh, become ill because of COVID. Those uh, sacrifices come at a cost. I think nurses have been willing to stand up time and time again, but nurses also need support. I think nurses have experienced a lot of psychological distress. I think the working conditions have been very, very challenging. And I think the kinds of experiences that all healthcare providers, including nurses, have encountered in the past 20 months has been pretty striking relative to what things were prior to COVID. And I would argue that they probably, in many places, were challenging even before COVID. So you can imagine the complexity of now what COVID uh, you know, has presented for healthcare broadly. In my view, that means a reinvestment in the healthcare workforce. That means a reinvestment in nurses and physicians and pharmacists and other frontline workers, respiratory therapists, et cetera. And we've got to spend some time realizing that we're not going to be able to deliver care whether it be for COVID or thinking uh, sort of about our future and thinking sort of ahead, if we don't have a healthy healthcare workforce, if we are if we're not sort of operating optimally, it's going to be very hard to respond. I do think because of COVID, we're seeing that there are uh, healthcare professionals, including nurses, that are exiting from the profession. They're exhausted. They have felt uh, really burdened uh, for some. It's been more than what they signed up for. There's also an incredible tension because nurses historically have been underpaid. And what's happened is that within this COVID context, we're finding that nurses are actually earning more. And what that's doing is that it's creating a lot of bidding between different states and different health systems to actually attract nurses who then become travel nurses. Well, what happens is that if you all go to X location where perhaps two or three times the salary that you're earning in your home location, it means that there's a shortage somewhere. And that somewhere is often in the place that needs nurses the most. 
and that needs the healthcare uh, team, the full team the most. And so we need to be mindful not only of allowing folks to have investments and support for the work they do, but also that salaries for the work that healthcare providers are doing uh, needs to be appropriately compensated. I think that another piece is that uh, our healthcare systems are uh, experiencing some difficulties in maintaining services that within the context of the current pandemic may be seen as ancillary. And so a lot of what's driving that is the absence of the nursing workforce. And certainly uh, many health systems across the country, the inability to expand and actually have those health systems grow, which uh, for a lot of us, where there's sort of, uh, you know, underserved populations that are not able to receive regular quality health care, we need health systems to expand. We can expand because we don't have the appropriate number of healthcare professionals, including nurses. And so I think that's a long way of saying that, you know, COVID has presented, uh, in my view, a big wake up call. The public health infrastructure in the United States has for some time uh, been underfunded. And I think we have not made enough investments in ensuring that we have a strong and robust public health workforce. And that means that our healthcare providers need to uh, be sort of able to operate at the full extent of what their scope of practice is. And we need to support us and support them in order to achieve the work that we all need as a country to grow. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And I've, I've learned a lot too um, by what you just said. And I'm curious um, when you talk about when I was thinking of burnout and you know people leaving the profession, they're not being support. Are there any ideas uh, or what from nurses themselves, like what, what can help with that? What can help with the burnout issue or, you know, in, you know, in terms of providing support? I think the first thing is really recognizing the contributions and, uh, you know, nursing, um, I think has for almost two decades been evaluated as the most trustworthy profession of all in the United States. It's close to two decades. And yet, uh, despite uh, the many contributions that nurses make to healthcare delivery, I don't think it's always the case that nurses are recognized for those contributions. And part of it is salary, and that's certainly an important piece of it. But another part of it is nurses being valued for what they bring to healthcare delivery. Nurses are holistic in you know, our approach. We think of people, not just diseases. We think of the physical, the psychological, the emotional, the spiritual. We also tend to focus heavily on prevention and wellness and not just responding uh, to illness. But we think about not only whether or not people can be cured or if there is appropriate treatments for whatever it is that's ailing them, but also how are they managing that? How does it impact their functioning, their quality of life, their families? We have a lot of functional uh, and locational flexibility. We're equally comfortable in sort of the brick and mortar healthcare system as we are in a school or a homeless shelter or, you know, my own work has been often uh, the US Mexico border working with undocumented individuals in route to the US or in settings that are not traditional healthcare settings. We uh, are champions of home visits. We do telehealth, we do after hours. We do tasks that are essential to improving clinical outcomes like medication adherence. We're often able to uh, work uh, interpersonally with patients that have comorbid psychiatric and also substance issues. I mean, there are many ways, Erin, that nurses contribute. And I'm not sure that that's the message that uh, is sort of shared and, and told when people think about healthcare delivery. Too often, and this is in no way sort of a criticism of physician colleagues, but too often uh, healthcare gets defined as being really physician driven. I think a lot of the accolades and credits go to uh, physicians. A lot of what we see is the discovery of new sort of science uh, and sort of new treatments, new uh, testing that often is associated with physicians. But behind those advances, there's probably lots and lots of nurses who make that come alive and work for the people who actually need and very much depend on those treatments, those innovations, whatever it is that's being developed. I think it's time, Erin, that nurses be recognized as important players. And again, it's not just salary, although that's certainly critical, but when it comes to being at the table, when it comes to thinking and imagining what a new healthcare system looks like, when it comes to having complementary 
you know, opportunities for uh, each discipline working uh, together to have better outcomes, but at the highest scope of their practice and what they're able and trained to do, it's time. Nurses need that in order to be satisfied in their work. Thank you for that. Um, so I wanted to talk more about the center that you founded. Congratulations. I, I went to the website. It looks amazing. Um, center for Latino Adolescent and Family Health at Duke University. So yeah. that's a great accomplishment. Can you talk, tell us more about what you hope to accomplish with the center? Well, I think, yeah, thank you. I'm really, I mean, it's just sort of personal and professional because I am Latino and I think that something that I've been really aware of, uh, and I'll start with New York City because I think New York City really captures it. One in three people in New York City right now is Latino. That is, I think, pretty, for many people, that's pretty uh, astonishing. About 30% of the population is Latino. And so you cannot talk about uh, New York City without in some way recognizing that the Latino community is in fact a big part of the population. That same demographic pattern is projected to be the case across the US. Latinos are growing, Latinos continue to grow. Right now, uh, the Latino community is the largest ethnic minority group in the country. And I think that often is unrecognized. And I think that what most people may not be aware of is that the vast majority of Latinos are actually born in the country. So it's not migration that is fueling the Latino population growth, it's actually fertility, it's births. And so about half of all Latinos are under the age of 30. So you're talking about a sleeping giant, a group of, of uh, individuals that are young and that hopefully given the fact that the vast majority are born white in this country, um, they are US citizens who hopefully will be able to contribute to the United States uh, in ways that are uh, supportive of the Latino community having a wonderful life trajectory, and also that they will be able to contribute to the fabric of what makes the US a great country, because we are a great country. That's why we have CLAF. CLAF is about how to support Latino adolescents and their families. How do we start to think about what are some of the challenges that Latino young people are facing? How do we develop uh, family-based responses that are evidence-based interventions to address uh, some of those challenges? How do we engage Latinos in healthcare and ensure that healthcare is culturally appropriate, that it is consistent with the preferences of the Latino community? Latinos are the most likely to be underinsured or uninsured. What also is unbeknownst to many people is that Latinos relative to all other uh, sort of groups in the country have the most, uh, the greatest proportion of involvement in the workforce. And so that might be striking. People might say, well, how could that be? Underinsured or uninsured? Well, the reason for that is that often the jobs that Latinos have, despite their sort of, or our being very much uh, in the workforce, is that the jobs come, they're service sector jobs. And so they don't come with health insurance benefits or they're inadequate health insurance benefits or the conditions where Latinos are working may be agriculture or construction or certain kinds of uh, service sector jobs that come with a lot of environmental exposure, uh, workplace exposures, where there may be injuries. And what we see is that rather than Latinos have a consistent source of health care, there's episodic uh, care with a different provider intervening at each particular visit. And then also often those services are not linguistically appropriate. They don't uh, sort of speak to the cultural nuance of the Latino community. So the treatment is not as sort of successful or optimal as it could be. I think that CLAF seeks to change that. It seeks to really highlight some of the disparities, some of the health uh, inequities, and then also thinking of practical solutions that can be scaled up nationally that are responsive to the needs of Latinos. A great example, Erin, that I'm very proud of that is very contemporary is actually happening right now in the Bronx. You know, I've only been at Duke for, since July 1 when I joined as the dean, but prior to that, I was at NYU and was working very hard on my, uh, you know, in my community in the South Bronx. So Mott Haven is in the South Bronx. It is a community that is primarily Latino, about 70 to 75% of the community is Latino. The remaining part of the community is African-American. It's the most disadvantaged uh, community in New York City. I think it's actually the poorest congressional district in the United States. On every single indicator 
uh, whether it be from education to housing to sort of negative involvement with the police to the availability of fresh fruit and vegetables, healthcare facilities, social service agencies, Mod Haven lags. Uh, it's only a couple of miles away from Manhattan where things are dramatically different. I think that when COVID hit, no surprise that Mod Haven already had been experiencing many negative health and social outcomes prior to COVID, but Mod Haven quickly became number one in terms of diagnoses, hospitalizations, and deaths in New York City. New York City at the start of COVID was the epicenter of the entire epidemic across our country. That really alarmed me because again, the personal and professional, I have a deep connection to the community where I'm from. And we saw that despite the fact that the CDC and New York State Department of Health and New York City Department of Health was putting out terrific guidance for how we could slow community spread of COVID, a lot of the guidance didn't really speak to the realities of the Latino community. So if you're living in public housing in New York City, and if you are deemed an essential worker, now a month before COVID, your work would not necessarily have been so valued. But within the context of COVID, many of us were able to stay home, but somebody was delivering food to our homes. Somebody was doing the food services in places like hospitals. Somebody was doing those jobs that kept New York City operating. It's also true that those uh, individuals tended to be communities of color and many of them were Latino. Well, in Mod Haven, we saw that household transmission was much, much greater than community spread. So what that means is somebody got infected in the home. Once that person got infected, then other members of that family soon after became infected. In that home, high density households with smaller spaces, more people living in public housing, intergenerational families, grandma, parents, children, oftentimes comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, the kinds of things that you would expect uh, in this particular community because of the conditions uh, in which people live prior to COVID. No surprise, COVID uh, had a huge impact. They weren't going into the healthcare facilities. They weren't reaching out to the pop-ups that the Department of Health was actually mounting to try to get people tested. Initially, we didn't have the vaccine. We had to basically uh, sort of quarantine and also, um, you know, testing event eventually became available in the community. And so we saw that despite the services being available, they weren't going. And so what we did was that we developed a nurse community health worker partnership. And we were able to write a grant to the National Institutes of Health through something called the Radix Up Initiative, which was a major investment from the federal government to respond to COVID in our country. Our grant was successful. We were funded to have nurses go door to door in housing projects in Mott Haven with community health workers who are individuals who reside in that community and try to reach families in their home, help them to develop uh, family-based uh, Latino culturally appropriate and African-American culturally appropriate a family plan of how they were going to mitigate COVID risk within their family, how they could actually access regular testing in their home and indicated testing in their home. And if they didn't have the vaccine, which thankfully many people now do have the vaccine uh, in New York, but if they didn't, then how we could get them vaccinated in their home. In addition, we had wraparound services that really uh, were provided by the community health workers that were focused on psychological distress and building strength and resilience in the families, and also uh, referral to social service and other kinds of agencies that can provide anything from a food pantry to a winter coat, uh, because our families were also suffering because COVID out had immobilized some of the income that they probably had prior to COVID. Long way of saying that CLAF uh, seeks to develop novel interventions that are in alignment with community, that take advantage of uh, sort of our healthcare workforce, in this case, nurses and community health workers, and that partner in ways that are distinctive, not as an individual uh, sort of plan where Erin, you or I stay home, or we socially distance, or we have homes that perhaps we have space that we can be apart from folks. Uh, but really, we think about how are we going to take a two-bedroom apartment where five or six people live, and where there's essential workers who work at bodegas and who do uh, food services in hospitals, et cetera, and how are we going to create safety when we know that people have uh, exposures and they live in conditions 
where it's harder to practice some of those community uh, you know, guidance that we get from CDC and other sources. So that's the project, it's going on now. We're very happy about it. And we think that we're gonna do better than our comparison group, which is the formal health system, which is basically families being referred to existing services. We think that our community approach and the model that we've developed is actually gonna outperform on each of our indicators. That's amazing. And that's the Nurse Community Family Partnership Program listed on your, your webpage. So that's yes. an on, ongoing study. That's really interesting. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I work in public health and I really love kind of those community based, well, family based initiatives. So I'm, I'm really interested to see how that turns out. You're doing other research. Um, can you just briefly mention some of the other things that you're working on? So really briefly, I think um, what I'll highlight is that we're doing a lot of work around sexual and reproductive health because uh, unfortunately, sexually transmitted infections continue to be at an all-time high in our country, and those are just reportable ones. And uh, despite the fact that young people, for the most part, represent about 25% of the total population of individuals who are sexually active, they represent about half of all the reportable STIs in a given year. So part of our work is really to help young people to prevent STIs, unplanned pregnancies. We know that where there's an unplanned pregnancy, often there's a sort of interruption in the normal trajectory that would be school and focusing on academics and hopefully developing a life course uh, that would lead to going to college or some kind of technical school. And unplanned pregnancy can actually be very disruptive for many uh, sort of Latino and other communities of, of color. And so we're working a lot in that space, again, using family-based perspectives. We're doing work, Erin, that is really timely that's about the U.S.-Mexico uh, border. Up until recently, it was heavily focused on Central Americans and Mexicans who were trying to seek better opportunities uh, in the U.S. Increasingly, and this has been all over the news, there are many other uh, sort of migrants that are at the border. I think most noteworthy is the community from Haiti that is actually at the border now because of conditions in Haiti. When we see all of that is also central to the work of CLAF, how do we think through binational or even regional solutions to thinking through why are people coming and how do we do this in a way that makes sense for all parties? Um, I think those are some of the things that we're really working on that are exciting and that are a part of CLAF. Inter all really great, interesting, timely stuff. I mean, I watch the, the stuff going on at the border and I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know how um, all that is going to turn out, but that's amazing that you're doing that. And um, Dr. Ramos, I want to thank you so much for sharing your perspective, joining us um, to our viewers. I hope you got something out of this podcast. And if you'd like to learn more about the center, can you tell us um, if anyone wants to learn more, read more about these projects, where can they go? So I think the best place to go is the Duke University School of Nursing, our website. And I think there's lots of information about our research centers. And one of them is CLAF, the Center for Latino Adolescent and Family Health. It also makes sense, Erin, to just Google CLAF because we've done a lot and we've gotten uh, some attention for the work that we've been doing across the country. Thank you. And I hope that the listeners enjoyed our time together. I certainly Absol did. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Ramos. Enjoy uh, the rest of your evening there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Stay good, Karen. Stay safe in New York. Yes, Thanks. will do. Bye-bye. Yeah.